Welcome to this week's edition of Under the Radar for Saturday, April 15th. And this week, we'll be looking at why diversity is the new conformity. So Mark Stein, who some of you may know, certainly Canadians will know him as no stranger to being caught in the politically correct crosshairs of Canada's Human Rights Commission, has put his finger on the diversity bullies insisting on conformity. Pink is now the colour of conformity. Today is the Day of Pink, the International Day Against Bullying, Discrimination, Homophobia and Transphobia. Don't know how big it is in Yemen or Waziristan, but the Minister of Education for the Northwest Territories is on board, and the Ontario MPP Peggy Nash has issued her own video greeting for the day, just like the Queen's Christmas message. Today's the day we can unite in celebrating diversity and in raising awareness. So it's just like every other bloody boring day in the Ontario school system then. Now I can feel some Thomas coming on. And let's also say that, that they also are African American. Mm-hmm. And that that ought to be a factor in, in choosing from that pool. Maybe that's one of the because, considerations. Because what? Uh, because diversity of a student body now, I, I is a healthy factor. I'm, I'm fascinated with the extent to which words, we, we're, we're conditioned to react like Pavlov's dog to words. I hear diversity. Someone was asking... That'll make me look bad, Professor. <laughs> Someone today who was, a, who, was a, who was a trustee of a college was saying that the, they were going to pick a new college professor. I said, what you should do is have a stopwatch there and just count how long it is until to, to, to each of the uh, contestants says the word diversity. Yeah. And the guy who says it, you know, he's 35 minutes into the interview, and the other guy who says it, you know, the first sentence, the guy who said it takes 35 minutes, he should be at the top of the list. The guy who said it the first sentence should be at the bottom. Meanwhile, Cable 14 in Hamilton, Ontario, has been tweeting up a storm. National Day of Pink Anti-Bullying Day is tomorrow. What will you be wearing? I don't think I have a choice on that front, do I? For schools holding anti-bullying events in April, you still have time to order shirts at a discount. Well, that's great news. Nothing says celebrate diversity like forcing everyone to dress exactly the same, like a bunch of Maoists who threw their workers' garb in the washer but forgot to take the red flag out. If you're thinking, hang on, day of pink, didn't we just have that? No, that was pink shirt day, the last Wednesday in February. This is day of pink, second Wednesday in April. Like the King Street car, there'll be another one along in a minute, enthusiastically sponsored by Scotiabank, Royal Bank, Via Rail, and all the other corporate bigwigs. And that's a good point. Corporations, not just governments, are getting behind the progressive agenda. Recently here in Australia, Qantas and Google virtue signalled their support for same-sex marriage by promoting the wearing of until we all belong rings. Of course, they maintain their staff are under no obligation to wear it. But what if you don't? Are you going to be outed as a homophobe? Especially in Qantas, since the CEO is gay, and there are, after all, a disproportionate number of gay people on air crews. Not that there's anything wrong with that. So back to the article, and Stein lays out the hypocrisy of all this awareness raising for selected identity groups. According to the Toronto District School Board's own survey, the most common type of bullying is for body image, the reason given by 27% of high school students, 38% of grades 7 and 8, and yeah, back through the generations. Yet there are no proposals for mandatory fat svelte alliances or homely smoking alliances. The second biggest reason in Toronto schools is cultural or racial background. And not to be outdone here in Australia, part of the Safe Schools program in Victoria provides resources to help schools deal with homophobia. Yet Victoria's Department of Education can't prove homophobic bullying. Instances of bullying are often recorded by schools. However, the root causes and reasons for bullying behaviour are often complex and may not be easily identifiable. Was the department's response to the public accounts an estimates hearing held in February? In many instances, children and young people involved in bullying are not able to clearly articulate the reason for their behaviour, therefore making reporting on the root causes for bullying behaviour unreliable. Yeah, but don't let that stop you from implementing a social engineering policy based on little to no evidence. Oh, but there is evidence. The Victorian Education Minister James Molino has been running around repeating the line that 75% of same-sex attracted youth had been bullied. So there. But that's not really true, is it? Because the report on which that stat is based required that participants self-select, meaning the sample group could not be considered representative of the broader same-sex attracted population. 
And that, folks, is one way to rig research to say what you want it to say. And what better way of signalling conformity than adhering to the latest fashion? Minority of children with gender issues diagnosed with gender dysphoria, psychiatrist says. Many children and adolescents are identifying as transgender because they are confused about sexuality or think it will make them different. Psychiatrist Stephen Stathis, who runs a gender clinic, said he had seen girls who'd been sexually abused and wanted to identify as transgender. The girls say, if only I'd been a male, I wouldn't have been abused, Dr. Stathis said. Now, yes, more examples of male privilege. He said the new statewide gender service at Brisbane's Lady Cliento Children's Hospital expected to see about 180 children with gender issues this year, but only a minority would be diagnosed with gender dysphoria. Dr. Stathis said by the time they reach puberty, most of those identify as their birth gender. Now, this is an important point. Of the 180 children, most of them will not be diagnosed with gender dysphoria. And of the ones that are, most of them will still revert to their gender of birth. I made this point before, and it comes straight from the DSM-5. Rates of persistence of gender dysphoria from childhood into adolescence or adulthood vary. In natal males, persistences range from 2.2% to 30%. In natal females, persistences range from 12 to 50%. So taking the midpoint of both, about 16% of natal males and 30% of natal females will have persistent gender dysphoria. So what about the majority of the 180 kids that present with gender issues? Well, the good doctor gives us some insight. Gender dysphoria is a strong, persistent feeling of identification with the opposite gender in discomfort with one's own assigned gender. He said that he'd seen a lot of adolescents trying out being transgender to stand out. One said to me, Dr. Steve, I want to be transgender. It's the new black, he said. Now that sounds eerily similar to what Jordan Peterson has been saying for months now. The gender expression, so-called, is just another word for fashion. The psychiatrist has also seen transgender children so desperate to start puberty blockers then progress to irreversible hormone treatment, they harm themselves. I've seen genital mutilation, some who try to cut off their penis, he said. The thought of touching their genitals is so abhorrent they don't wash them and get infections. At the end of last year, there was a two-year waiting list of 100 children wanting to be assessed at the hospital. With state funding, the wait is now down to three or four months, and the new gender service has seen more than 60 patients since December. Well, isn't that wonderful? Accelerating funding so we tell more kids they're gender-fluid unicorns. So perhaps the best way to end this shit show is by combining the aforementioned Mark Stein and Jordan Peterson talking about this issue on a recent episode of Mark Stein's TV show. You know, I've made the claim that in my classes that I don't buy the distinction between sex and, and gender, which was invented by John Money yeah. back in 1955, a single theorist, yeah. and whose ideas I think were quite badly discredited, uh, especially by his involvement in the Johns Hopkins Gender Reassignment Clinic, which shut down just a few years ago. Yeah. That was his baby, and they decided that gender reassignment surgery was a well, catastrophe. Yes, and I, I mean, this, uh, and yet it is becoming ever more state imposed because we have situations now um, in Australia and the United Kingdom where children are taken away from their parents, grade school children, mm -hmm. seven, eight, nine, if the parents don't want to go along with the, uh, the gender reassignment. Yeah. Uh, yeah, well, there was one gender reassignment clinic for children several years ago, and now and the person who started that has now, is now running 43. Yeah. And in Canada, um, if a child at school decides to use the alternate pronoun to adopt a different gender identity, the schools are forbidden to tell the parents so, and yes, increasingly, they're doing gender reassignment on children who, are, so, who are very young. And so, again, it's, uh, it's part of the state's appropriation of their, the parental role. The parents don't get to have a say. If, if, if the seven-year-old boy decides he wants to be a seven-year-old girl, the parents uh, are sidelined in, in whether the boy gets to do that. Basically. Yes, yes. Yeah, yeah. Which is... Which is uh, wicked and totalitarian. Yes, yes. Well, you know, you might want to leave the knives and the hormones for later in life. I mean, Ken Zucker, who was at, the, uh, at Toronto's big um, uh, hospital for, for the mentally ill, he, was, uh, he worked on gender dysphoria. 
And his basic proposition was that you should wait because most people who, are, who have gender dysphoria when they're young decide that they're homosexual. But about 90% of them settle into their biological identity by the time they're adults. And, his, his, and so his tack was to wait and see. And they scuttled his career, fired him. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And again, because of this uh, opposition to uh, essentially an official ideology yep. that didn't exist uh, until the day before yesterday. Right, exactly. So that's going to do it for this week's Under the Radar, a little shorter than usual, but I've decided to take it a little bit easy over this Easter weekend, and I hope you find the time to relax a bit too. See you next time.